Okay, uh, welcome to all of you, the many, many of you who have joined us for this webinar today. Uh, I'm Louise Overton, Associate Professor of Social Policy and Director of CASM at the Centre on Household Assets and Savings Management here at Birmingham. CASM is an interdisciplinary research centre undertaking academic policy relevant research into the global and uh, local challenge of financial risk and insecurity facing a growing number of households. We use our research evidence to understand the causes and consequences of these challenges and to improve household financial well-being. First, I just want to go through a few notes on how things are going to proceed over the next hour or so, and a reminder that this webinar will be recorded. So if you haven't already, please click, click continue uh, when asked, but only the speakers will be captured on the recording. Please also submit your questions via the Q&A box, and we'll do our best to answer them during the session. You may be asked to pose your question directly to the panel, in which case your mic will be turned on. Otherwise, all mics and videos cameras will be turned off throughout. But if you'd rather not ask your question directly or would like to remain anonymous, please also put that in the Q&A. And feel free to use the chat function throughout the webinar. Uh, then around 12.45, we'll open to the floor for questions. So that's the housekeeping out of the way. Um, and now onto the interesting part. We're delivering this session today as part of the Bring in Birmingham to You event series from the Alumni Office. The series aims to bring Birmingham academics to our global community. Don't worry, no prior knowledge of the subject matter is needed. The idea is for academics to discuss and share their research in, a, in an informal way, giving our alumni community a chance to meet and hear from some of the people helping lead the way in the arts and sciences. I'd now like to invite the panel to introduce themselves and provide a brief overview of their current work, starting with Danny and then Adele and then Jing. Thanks, Louise. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us here today. My name is Danny McGowan. I am a professor of finance in the business school here at Birmingham. I'm also, like Louise, part of the CASM Research Centre as well. So most of my research focuses on understanding the behaviour of banks as well as household finances. And to give you a flavour of what I've done recently, one project looks to understand whether the UK government's furlough scheme led to financial distress during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, what my co-authors and I find in that piece of work is that it did. Households who were furloughed were significantly more likely to fall behind on their housing payments, notably for rent, as well as other types of bills. But those effects tended to be small, and in fact, only about 6% of the UK workforce were adversely affected by that scheme. Now, there were two reasons for that. First, despite being dreamt up within two hours on a Saturday morning, the scheme was incredibly well designed. Paying 80% of monthly wages by the government rather than employers allowed most, budget, most households to remain within budget. Interestingly, one of the things we find is that increasing the generosity of the scheme wouldn't actually have alleviated financial distress or done much. And that's reassuring to some extent. It means that the scheme delivered a benefit. It minimized the incidence of financial distress at the lowest cost to taxpayers. The second reason was that households who were furloughed often cut their expenditure, sometimes quite dramatically, and they also drew down their savings to deal with the 20% reduction that most experienced in their monthly earnings. So while the scheme was beneficial, prevented them falling behind on their bill payments, most of these people end up living more miserable lives. They cut back on luxury consumption, as well as in some time, in some cases, goods and services that are essential. It also led to wealth inequality as they drew down their savings. And ultimately, those effects linger until today because by exhausting their savings, those people go into what looks like a fairly severe crisis now in a pretty bad financial state, albeit one that would have been worse had they not had a furlough scheme available to them. But in terms of its impact, something Louise has mentioned already, I think this had had some influence beyond just the academy. It's affected governments, policymakers, as well as third sector organizations. To give you some overview of what we've achieved with that, our research has been cited in four House of Commons parliamentary inquiries, and notably the Public Account Committee's initial report into the government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's also used by the Money and 
pension service, for example, to educate consumers. And we've established a number of high level connections with policymakers in the OECD, central banks around Europe, as well as people like Tim Lunig, the architect of the furlough scheme in HM Treasury. One outcome of those discussions has been to develop ideas about a targeted furlough scheme that could perhaps be deployed in future to deal with recessions, essentially a support mechanism for both households and, importantly, businesses as well. What we've tried to dream up there is a package which delivers the same types of benefits, albeit at much reduced cost. And certainly our estimates show that this would have cost about $2 billion to address the adverse effects of the financial crisis, which seems fairly cheap considering all of the financial hardship and difficulty that so many households and individuals experience because of it. If you'd like to read more about that, we have an article that's been published this week in The Conversation. I think I'll leave it there now, Louise, and pass over the virtual microphone. Thanks, Danny. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm a professor of practice in financial literacy and financial well-being. I'm also a member of CASM, and I've only recently joined the University of Birmingham. Before that, I was working for an international development organization called the OECD, where I was heading up their work on financial education. And actually, most of my career has been looking at what we can do to help people to understand their financial lives and where necessary to provide them with the support to be able to access the financial products that they might need or to be able to use them in a way that's more appropriate to their circumstances. Um, currently, I'm working on financial inclusion with CASM. We're just finalizing a report, which I'm sure will give you some very interesting but terrifying uh, statistics. It's one of those topics where we're seeing extremes and we're seeing things that we really hope not to see. The work on financial inclusion has been going on for 10 years, so I've joined it right at the end. And of course, after 10 years, we all want to say something is better, but actually, the situation we're in at the moment means that is not the story that we are seeing <clears throat> excuse me it's not the reality for the vast majority of people and when i say vast majority i actually mean it our data which i can't provide you with the numbers at the moment but it is showing that people the the majority of people were already cutting back over the last 12 months and not surprisingly more of them expect to be doing so in the next 12 months so we're seeing a real crisis at the the very root of our society and unfortunately there is no quick solution the data shows us as well that the the benefits that people are receiving are not keeping pace with with the changes uh, in costs that we're seeing so life is getting very very difficult and we also know that this is having an impact on people's mental health it's not a financial story because life isn't a financial story and one of the reasons that financial education is so interesting to me is that if you can help people to calm one aspect of their lives, it can have a ripple effect over lots of different aspects of their lives, including their families. We, we don't live in bubbles. We, we live in families. We live in communities. We, we go to work and we work with people who are facing similar challenges to us. So everywhere we go, if we can be a little bit calmer and better able to manage the horrific circumstances around us, the better it is uh, for our society as a whole. Um, I think I'll stop there, Louise, but I'm more than happy to talk more about what I do. Thank you, Adele and Jing. OK, thank you, Louise. Well, thank you for inviting me to this event. And it is my pleasure to be here today. Well, as far as I know, our audience is from more than 20 different countries. So good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to you. Well, as Louis introduced, then my name is Jing Du, and I'm the Associate Professor in Department of Finance in Birmingham Business School. Well, as you all know that we are all in a critical moment due to sharply increase the inflation, we are experiencing higher prices on our everyday goods and services causing us to spend hundreds of pounds more on our daily bills. Well, apart from individuals, businesses are also suffering because of the higher cost they face at this moment. And the prices have increased by, as you all know, 9.9% .9 compared to a year ago. 
and that is well above the two percent target set by the Bank of uh, uh, set, set by the Bank of England. Well, besides, we expect the rate of inflation to further increase in the near future. Well, to be honest, in my biased opinion, even if the rate of inflation will slow down in the near future, the prices of some goods and services may stay at a high level compared with the past. And in the meanwhile, the interest rate on saving accounts and our income, well, for many of us, I believe, stay the same as it was a year ago. It means that our money losing value in real terms. As this cost of living crisis is part of my life, I'm quite interested in this area. I totally understand that both the consumer's confidence and the overall financial well-being of UK households experienced a decline, but we are not alone. It is more like a global issue. So don't be panic. And to me, it is more important to understand where we are at this moment and prepare for it by controlling and managing our financial decisions. And I believe that we will explore this during the next one hour. So I will just stop here. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Jane. Well, thank you all. And thank you for giving uh, an introduction to the topic today. I I need to say very little else, I, I think, really, but perhaps just by way of summary or overview um, on the topic today. As we all know, the UK's cost of living crisis is the worst in 50 years. After falling to near zero in 2021, inflation has reached double figures in 2022 and is predicted to rise still further. And this, as people have been saying already, is leaving millions of households facing acute financial strain and struggling to afford everyday essential items like food, like clothing, fuel and, of course, energy to heat their homes. Many households are already falling into arrears or resorting to using credit to pay for essentials. So I'd like to start the discussion today by asking the panel for their thoughts on how we got here. What are the key causes and consequences for, uh, of the cost of living crisis? And could it have been avoided? Perhaps to start us off as a discussion point, we might start with the energy crisis. Is it really all to do with Russia's war in Ukraine? I think I'll start with Adele. Well, uh, thank you for the question, Louise. It, it's certainly an interesting one. It's not at all my area of expertise, but obviously it's something that we think about very uh, deeply when we try to understand how people are managing their finances. It strikes me that you can always look back and see how things could be done differently. And for me, one of the things that could have been done differently is that we could have encouraged people to spend their money differently when they had surplus money. And one of the ways obviously in which they could have helped themselves in this current situation is to spend more on insulating their homes, on preparing for a more green in fact, but also a more energy efficient future. Uh, it's difficult because at the time that wasn't people's priorities, but we know that there used to be uh, systems in place to encourage people. And in fact, they used to get subsidies in order to make it seem like an attractive proposition. We also know that this is a solution that only helps people that either own their own house or have a very understanding landlord, and it doesn't help everybody. But it is one part of a larger picture that we missed an opportunity when people did have surplus funds to actually use that money to put themselves in a better situation in the future. We, we can see it as an investment that was missed. It was an opportunity that wasn't used when it could have been. I think we also have to look at the, the balance of different uh, sources of energy that we use in this country and the way in which we use them. And we also have to remember actually that the prices have gone up, not just for individuals, but uh, as Jing was saying, we are also facing a problem because the prices are going up for our industries, for, for our entrepreneurs, for our small businesses, everybody is facing the same kinds of issues. So it's, it's a complicated one. And I'd really like to hear what the other panelists say and maybe come back to it because I do think that we can look to other countries, we can see there are differences but ultimately, historically, certain decisions were made that you can't easily unpull. 
decisions like turning away from coal, you know, I'm currently sat in Yorkshire many, many years ago. This was the heart of, of, of coal mining. It's not anymore. And that was a decision made a very long time ago. But when we look at other countries that do still have access to coal, then they're in a different situation. So everything that happens in the past has an influence on the future. And for us now, it's deciding which of those things could be unpicked and which of those things are historical and we should not focus on them anymore. Thank you, Adele. Uh, Danny, your thoughts and, and, and then Jing, if you have any thoughts as well. Uh, okay, thanks. Thanks, Louise. Um, I think Adele covered a lot of things that were important there. Um, I've just made a few notes. Um, so I think energy security is important and the UK is probably overly reliant on gas for heating. Um, that's not something you can change very quickly overnight, given the nature of power networks and how expensive it is to actually make those investments to, to change that distribution network. Um, all, one thing that we saw during the 2010s was the, the government stepped back from providing incentives for renewable energy production. And before that, the UK was installing tons of turbines and solar, solar energy um, yearly. It was way ahead of everywhere else in Europe at that point. And, and that has cut back a lot uh, recently, um, in part because those types of price support or minimum price mechanisms are not available to industry, as well as agricultural producers, um, who, despite uh, the current government's um, policy on that, um, have done a really good job of expanding natural uh, natural uh, or renewable energy production. Um, but there's a few other things that don't help us. We don't have liquefied natural gas terminals. So even though during the current crisis, um, countries in Europe have been able to import LNG, the UK hasn't been able to do so. So wholesale gas prices remain high and it's very difficult to, 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 to benefit from that and pass it on to consumers if you just don't have the availability there. Um, one other thing, which is also historic, the UK, like most countries in Europe, is not part of an joined up international energy market grid. And that's something that really hurts the UK, especially if you think about Northern Ireland, where I'm from. Um, you have a monopoly produ producer there, and you could dial into the rest of Ireland. You can't do that because there's no connections um, and that's not going to change anytime soon, I guess, with Brexit. Uh, so I think all of these things contribute to where we are now, albeit I think coming back to the original question, sure, the war is the main reason why we're seeing such a contraction in supply and, and ultimately an increase in those prices. Thanks, the other Danny. factors matter. Yeah, sure. And um, um, I guess the, the issue is about how sort of prepared we were beforehand and uh you know what could have been done differently so that we weren't quite at the mercy of uh the aftershock of the of the war in in ukraine what about then what, what are people's thoughts on the role of um publicly owned energy companies um i think as probably many of us will know the labor party have have announced their commitment to uh to launching great british energy uh one such publicly owned energy company to what extent would that might that um improve the problem um and are there any lessons from overseas that will tell us that, that, that could tell us this is a good thing to do or uh, uh proceed with caution jane if you have any thoughts on that or indeed anybody else Well, thank you, Louise, for yeah, for asking me for that. Actually, I think uh, as uh, Adela and Danny mentioned that it is a complex uh, problem. So there are many issues that uh, lead to the situation where we are at this moment. So uh, I think it may take a while to take the full effect to realize if these energy plans and this announcement and this package would help with the business owners and the individuals. So uh, I think it's really, you know, uh, need to take time to see the full effect. But apart from that, I think, uh, well, of course, as you mentioned that uh, the war could be a reason to cause the inflation. Apart from the war, uh, we should realize that at this moment, uh, we still uh, lack of some commodities and we still lack of some heroes. 
and this uh, lack of uh, commodities and uh, materials actually lead to the imbalance in supply and demand. So if there is an imbalance in supply and demand, of course, we know they will cause high prices. So I, th uh, I think that is something we could uh, you know, think about how to deal with how, in, how to balance the supply and the demand in the market, not just about the energy, but also about, the, about other things as well. But I'm really happy to you know, hear what the other panelists uh, thought. Thank you, Jing. Uh, I think we have uh, we do have a question in the chat from uh, from the audience. Let's let's pick that one up. Would revival of nuclear power help in the long term? To anybody who wants to answer that, uh, I, I have one immediate thought. Sorry, Danny, do you want to go, go first? Go on, that's all. <laughs> I'll go first. I, I think we have to be very careful about the fact that we can't see any policy in isolation and. Whatever we think about nuclear and whether we think it's clean energy or not, we know it's a security risk. And so any decision that we make has to be made across different areas of policy and with our population in mind, because a change that brings us unintended consequences is not helpful. Uh, and now I'll hand over to Danny. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks, Nadal. Um, on nuclear, one of the problems is just the sheer cost of building a power plant and the UK government has consistently not been able to do that and it's one of the reasons why it's been trying to get say EDF uh, or Chinese contractors to, to build Hinkley B um, because we just don't have the cash for that so there's, there's huge upfront costs involved in this. Um, is it useful in the long term? I would argue yes I think nuclear fuel is something that is probably easier to procure uh, than gas from Russia, given that the US has large deposits of it, um, as, as well as some other countries that the UK is probably more uh, friendly with than, than, than in the gas market. Um, I, I'm going to qualify that by saying I'm a, I'm a financial economist. I don't specialize in energy markets. So, so that's really um, just, just my intuition more than anything. Coming to your question, Louise, though, about publicly owned energy companies, uh, I think I'm probably a bit different from other people's perspective on this. Uh, I think if, if it's a natural monopoly, which can deliver the lowest marginal cost to producers or to consumers, yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, do those natural monopolies often exist? It's very hard to run them, and there's always lots of incentive problems within those companies. Um, it's also important to think about, is this a producer of energy or is it a supplier? And I think... The Robin Hood experience in Nottingham is a good example of what can go wrong if this is a, a, just an energy supplier. Um, if it's a producer, which I think is what the labor plans are to look to, to introduce, then I think that's probably where you're going to get much more benefits. Um, because the, the problem we're facing at the moment is that producers are essentially setting a high price, whereas suppliers aren't. So it's a, a vertically integrated market that you have to address. Which stage of it you address is really important here. Thank you all. I think uh, I, conveniently timed, I was going to move the discussion on anyway, and uh, we've also had a prompt from uh, from one of our participants to do so as well. So um, uh, perhaps we will come back to, to Viv's point about um, whether it's affordable for all new homes to be built with solar panels a bit later in the in the discussion if we have the time. But for now, let's let's move the discussion on to perhaps some of the broader issues around the economy and the role of the mini budget. So again, as I think many people are aware, we are in a period of sort of stagnation uh, or in fact decline, I think now uh, in 2022, following a post COVID bounce back in GDP, um, growth has stagnated and, and, and indeed now in decline. So what then uh, is the role of the government's recent tax cuts and uh, wider measures announced in the mini budget in relation to all of this uh, will sort of the government's tax cuts unfunded tax cuts that have been announced and and uh, a commitment to trickle down economics help us to achieve that all important growth or a return to growth danny no um no it won't so uh, 
trickle down economics is something that has been tried before, and in, in, notably in Reagan's administration in the US, and it usually doesn't really do much. Now, the reasons for that are, for many people, I guess, obvious, uh, but for some policymakers, they, they certainly believe in this. If you think about it, certainly with respect to things like cutting the 45% tax rate, you're giving a tax break to people who are either already wealthy or else have really high income, and they tend to have low marginal propensities to consume. For every additional pound of disposable income they have, they don't need to buy much more. If you're already living well, well what more is there to buy? Another ivory back scratcher. So what? Um, so in that case, the tax cut leads to an increase in disposable income, most of which is saved rather than spent through consumption. And that means there's going to be less demand created for further down the stream where we're supposed to see this trickling down. So there's not going to be the increase in jobs or demand for other types of goods and services that would then benefit workers who would be on, say, a lower income. Thank you, Danny, for such a decisive response there. And that was also appreciated by one of the members uh, of our audience, Adele. I, I totally concur but with a no. <laughs> I, I think uh, it's not just us sat on this panel that would give you that answer. The markets have given you that answer. Even the Bank of England have given that answer. Unfortunately, the focus on growth is probably not the right one at the current time. Um, only a couple of weeks ago, I was sat with a panel of five European central bankers, and they were all saying that growth is not the target at the moment. Stability is the target. What we need to do at the moment is to stop inflation from running away with us. And yes, that hurts, but it's going to hurt whatever. Unfortunately, most of us have lived through fluctuations in the past. They're not pleasant. We have to find a way of supporting the people who get hurt the most, not help those people who are going to be comfortably off and see very little benefit, uh, as Danny said, from the incentive that was going to come their way. Um, so yeah, it's, it's the wrong time to be focusing on growth. It's the wrong way to focus on growth. And it totally overlooked the possibilities of really supporting those people that are struggling the most today or that will become uh, in difficult, will, will get in difficult situations over the coming 12 months, two years, unfortunately. Thanks, Adele. And Jane? Yeah, oh, well, I to I'm totally with Adele and Danny in terms of this point. And apart from uh, what they has just mentioned that uh, this mini budget and the tax reduction indeed does not help the people who need help. It just give more benefits to the people who are already wealthy. So apart from that, I think uh, the tax reduction is not just, uh, you know, the domestic, uh, I mean, the tax reduction will not just affect the domestic situation. It will also have an impact internationally. So as we know that uh, uh, almost immediately after the announcement of the mini budget, the British pound value was going quite weak in the international market. So if we have a weak British pound in the international market, I mean, in terms of the exchange rate, then it will affect not just about the individual, but also about the business. Because if the business want to buy something from abroad, then it costs more. So it will increase the cost of the business. And uh, I'm afraid that for the business, sometimes they have to pass on this negative effect to the consumers. So we will bear this high cost. So it's not just about the national issue, it's, uh, it will also affect you know, overseas and affect the exchange rates internationally. So I think we should be more careful about this kind of the policies. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm just, I am trying to keep an eye on both the chat and another document that we have here uh, where questions are coming in. And there are a few in our Q&A that I just want to um, address if we can right now. So um, somebody's asked, beyond abandoning the money budget, what single policy could this imploding conservative government adapt 
to involve the cost of living for its to involve the cost of living for its citizens in view of our improve the cost of living perhaps for its citizens in view of our poor financial outlook. Um, an observation, not a question, to add to Danny's point, the rich take the money gained from lower taxes and invest it into asset classes, which makes housing more unaffordable for working families. So not only does it not trickle down, it actively worsens inequality. Uh, absolutely. So the question really there is, what else could this Conservative government do beyond abandoning uh, the mini budget? Danny. Oh, OK. Um big question i guess one of the, the one of the biggest items of one of the biggest costs at the moment is is energy and and utilities and the uk government's approach to this has essentially been to absorb the shock and then distribute the cost of that over the future which in principle is not a bad idea i'd argue that a better way of doing this is to adopt the policy the iberian governments have been approaching the energy market with, where rather than using, say, marginal pricing to determine uh, what, what the uh, unit cost paid to all producers of either electricity or gases, uh, to go to deviate away from that. Uh, so ultimately, the price you're paying for gas is going to be the highest bid in the market that fulfills total supply, whereas lots of producers are bidding below that. And I think that would be one way of cutting those costs dramatically and also alleviating the fiscal burden that's going to build up from uh, essentially ensuring ensuring households against that shock. So I think moving away from marginal pricing in the energy market is something that's I think would be a good idea. Thank you, Danny. Does anybody else have any thoughts before I again sort of quickly move us on so that we can get through all the important topics that we wanted to cover today? I'm, I'm happy to say something, but it's not going to be a single solution and it's not a quick fix. So it's probably not exactly what you want to hear. But I think one of the other areas that we really need to look at carefully as a nation is food security. It's interesting because I see we have a comment about farmers, which is not what triggered my thought. But we, we have become a country that's incredibly reliant on imports for certain parts of, of, of our everyday uh, food. And I think that is something that's going to have to change. And there's lots of I, I like to say technological solutions, and they are in a way that they're innovative, but we do need to look at those to see which ones work, to see how we're using our land, to make sure we're using it again in a way that is also consistent with what we know about climate change, what we know about pollution, what we know about the fact that our country is not going to look the same in 100 years as it looks now but really to start to think about what we can do to support ourselves, which in turn will obviously help us to, to monitor costs and in time to bring them down. Although we will still be reliant on, I muted myself, on some level of imports. That's, that's not going to go away. I think it is important to also go back to the question of energy efficiency, uh, both at the national level and at the household, local level. I think that's something we can look at one of the things that's been striking me recently is with more and more people doing a little bit of work in the office and a little bit of work at home we actually waste an enormous amount of energy by trying to light up and warm offices that are barely being used and also trying to keep ourselves warm at home all day where previously our houses might have been empty all day so we have a lot of things to think about in terms of really everyday policies that could be changed i know these are not the financial solutions that the original question was about but i think they are important um, and one final thing that i think is probably really important is that whether the energy sector comes back to the public or whether it remains a, a profit making uh, um, sector, I think it's important that the regulation is right. I, I've seen myself that fixed costs on individual bills are very high. So people actually have quite limited ability to manage their bill just by cutting back because they're paying a huge amount anyway. And I think things like that could be addressed regardless of who owns this sector. Thank you, Adele. OK, well, there was a comment. Uh, this is this is really just to, to keep this in your in your heads, really. Um, it's an it's an interesting one. And I think it's absolutely worth sort of saying and bearing in mind is worth ever the answer. Shouldn't we be looking towards a focus on sustainable development, not growth in the traditional sense, which really picks up on the the. Um, I guess the comments that we've been making there or alluding to in relation to climate change. 
But let's move on to, to the issue of mortgages, to lending and borrowing more broadly. So we've talked about energy costs being the highest, if you like, and some of the most, uh, some of the most harmful during this cost of living crisis. But there is, of course, commentary around the increase in, uh, in mortgage repayments and how they, those might, in fact, dwarf really the, uh, the energy cost rises. And that might become the very next, if not already, crisis in this broader cost of living crisis. So an estimated 1.3 million uh, homeowners will come to the end of fixed rate deals in 2022, with a further 1.8 million remortgaging in 2023. And due to the uh, Bank of England increase in the interest rate in the base rate. This means people's mortgage payments are going up by as much as, or will go up by as much as five hundred pounds a month. What does all this mean for for home ownership, for wealth acquisition and wealth inequality, and what does it mean for the position of different groups. Sorry, several questions in one there, not very helpful. But we know that housing wealth is, is, is concentrated in the hands of older homeowners, that young adults are seriously struggling to get onto the property ladder without any kind of additional, often parental support. I saw something recently which said that there isn't one region in the UK now where um, uh, a first time buyer can, can, can buy a property on a single income. It requires dual dual earner household. So are we heading for a another major, major crash? And yeah, what does it mean? What does it mean for sort of for home ownership and for wealth acquisition and inequality more generally? I will start with Jing and then Danny. Okay, thank you, Louise. Well, I think, yes, uh, the high interest rate have uh, a direct impact in the housing market. Uh, basically from two perspectives. The first the perspective is that we can say the UK housing market has been remarkably resilient in the past. Uh, it survives from the Brexit, from the pandemic, and the ongoing cost of living crisis. However, also we, we can identify some signs that the property market face uh, challenges at this moment. And there are some surveys and report shows that the UK housing price will drop about 5% over the next two years. And uh, they also warned that this could uh, fall as much as 15% 15, uh, 15 you know, uh, in the longer term. So this trend could be good news for investors and home buyers. But we should also bear in our mind that on the other hand, the rising interest rate would impact homeowners and new home buyers negatively in terms of the mortgage parts. So for the uh, for the people who have the variable mortgage or tracker mortgage, they will suffer from the immediate negative impact immediately. So they will see that their monthly payment increase, you know, almost uh, immediately. And for those who have a fixed uh, uh, mortgage rates when they will face uh, they will need to pay more when they need to remortgage and also i mean more importantly after the announcement of the mini budget in the market you can see that there were nearly about uh, a thousand fewer mortgage product available in the market so it makes the people more difficult to find a proper market pro product for the for them to you know when they buy the homes I think it's more it's more important for us to to consider where uh, to consider where you are to consider where you are before you take a mortgage. Like you need to compare the different. Uh, uh, like you you need to think about how much you can borrow and how big is your deposit and uh, how you want to pay your mortgage. Like uh, only repayment or interest or interest only. So there are a lot of questions you need to ask yourself before you take a mortgage and there are a lot of mortgage product uh, maybe we can i will stop here and uh, listen to the others and if we need to talk about a mortgage pro product we can come back later thanks jane danny do you have any thoughts to add uh, a few things so i'd agree with a lot of what jing says so it's, it's often quite difficult to think about um to, to use equ economics terminology, what's the equ equilibrium effects of this shock? So on the one hand, you have higher interest 
rates, which is going to lead to pressure on households' budgets. It's also probably the primary way through which we're going to address inflation. And ultimately, that's something we need to get rid of in the long run. Um, but as you rightly point out, Louise, there are big distributional impacts of that. Um, so home ownership rates, what could happen there? Well, I guess you, on the one hand, they could go down. On the other, houses potentially become a less in attractive investment property for some people, and you know, perhaps prices fall as a result. It's also worth mentioning that renters are potentially really adversely affected by this, where all of these costs get passed along to them by landlords. And another group of society that's adversely affected by falling house prices uh, is entrepreneurs. They often use their house as collateral to secure credit, uh, to make investments in new businesses and to expand them. So it, it's not just that cutting house prices is a good thing. I think there's, there's bigger effects out there. Um, one other thing I think is worth mentioning, uh, which is perhaps the bright side of inflation, um, people who are actually mortgagees and highly indebted are essentially inflating away their debt at the moment and they're winning. Um, so there are huge trade-offs here. I'm not sure what the net effect of them is though. Yeah, no, indeed. We, uh, I was, I was, I was going to come on to that, that the other side of, uh, of, of inflation and also obviously interest rate rises, of course, if you're saving the interest rate rises are best news. Adele. There are so many uh, issues within this uh, conversation about mortgages, but just to pick up on one that Jing uh, didn't talk about, but she stopped at that point, uh, and one that I did talk about recently at a forum uh, designed specifically to bring uh, academics and policymakers together to discuss financial literacy. And one of the things that we know is mortgage products are incredibly complicated. And at the moment, the choice is still very, very high. But very few of them are really designed with people's budgets over the long term in mind. Uh, in the UK, people still fix for very relatively short periods, and they have an expectation of inflation that at the moment has proved to be way off. And so they are going to face difficulties. Um, but the product doesn't need to be designed like that. One of the um, Nobel Prize winners, in fact, who was speaking at the event that I just mentioned, he suggested a product which makes a lot of sense, where actually your payments are fixed, but the term varies. So you don't sign up for a 25-year mortgage. You sign up for a £400 a month mortgage. And if your £400 a month mortgage is going to take you 40 years, then obviously there will be some calculation in terms of long-term risk and whether you will still be working in order to repay it. But basically, you have that certainty that you're not going to face a sudden increase in your bills without necessarily being able to afford to pay it back. And of course, there are all kinds of ways in which products could also be designed to increase payments when your salary goes up, if you can afford to make the extra payments. There are ways in which you can design it so that as you reach a different life stage, you can change your payments. So you have children, you may want to drop them. You find yourself suddenly in a position where you have two incomes after only having one income, you may want to increase them. The products at the moment are designed for the benefit of the financial service providers, but not necessarily with the, the reality of everyday households in mind. Yeah, I totally agree with Adela about this financial literacy, but just uh, I just want to add a very quick point to this one. I mean, it may take a while for you know consumers and individuals to develop a proper financial literacy. So another thing I think it might be helpful is uh, you know when we face the different types of the mortgage product, we may feel confused, we may lost. So there is another thing you can do is there are some tools like online tools to compare the different mortgage product. Of course, you cannot rely your decision purely on those comparisons like by using these online tools. But at least it can give you a brief idea about each mortgage product. And by looking at these comparisons, you can you know start to build up your financial literacy, you know, gradually. Yeah. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Adele. Danny? Um, just to add one thing, um, th this might not be a popular viewpoint, but I think we have to think about the financial sector here and also 
that the increase in interest rates is putting a lot of pressure on households to repay, but that has bigger effects as well. And we're already seeing banks like Santander reporting higher non-performing loan rates uh, coming from mortgages. And if this goes big enough, that ultimately has, well, financial stability implications, um, particularly in the UK where lenders end up holding all of these mortgage loans on their balance sheet as assets and they can't sell them off and diversify them as easily as uh, say in the US or Spain and other countries. So it's an issue that goes beyond just households. It's banks and lenders matter as well in this discussion. We have to think about that because if they fall over, there are big impacts for everyone as well. Danny, there were a couple of sort of practical uh, questions, if you like, uh, questions where people are asking for tips on, on what they should do, what's, what's the best course of action right now. Perhaps we'll just, Adele has responded to one of those in the chat, perhaps we'll just speak to the other one and then we'll, we'll move on before we run out of time to think about some of the policy solutions and that will capture some of people's some of the questions that people have been posing around universal basic income and a focus on well-being measures rather than the traditional economics approach to GDP so very quickly um, thank you Adele for responding to that question but that was a that was a question around overpaying one's mortgage and whether if you have a fixed rate at the moment that's quite low should you should you overpay as much as you can um, and the other just bear with me. Uh, was uh, somebody here? We are for somebody in a position to purchase a house as a first-time buyer with a reasonable amount of money in the bank for a deposit. Does it make more sense to wait until things are calmer and potentially be better off by earning money from interest? So, does anybody have any? Uh, we're not financial advisors, and we are not. Uh, I, we should caveat some of this with uh, with not being able to make personal recommendations on what to do. But anybody have any thoughts? by web guidance, not advice. I, I, I am not going to give any advice, but what I, what I would say is from a personal perspective, I'm also have something at the moment. And I don't believe that my savings are earning enough in the bank for them to, um, to keep up with inflation. And that is something of concern for me. So it's definitely worth looking at exactly how interest rates are affecting your overall financial situation and how they will continue to affect your situation if you borrow rather than having savings. But do keep in mind the, the impact of inflation. It's it's high at the moment it's looking like it's going to be high for quite some time and because we're unlikely to see significant growth it's possible that we'll see higher unemployment in time it's possible that we'll see difficulties that we're not facing at the moment and so the overall decision is incredibly complex and it's really worth sitting down and doing some scenarios in your own mind imagining yourself in five years and imagining what the worst possible outcome for you would be and what the best possible outcome for you would be as well as what you think is most likely. Um, there are no easy answers, but hopefully a trigger just to think about the possibilities because there are many and it's complicated. Indeed, any, any other thoughts from anybody before we move on? I'm, I'm not going to take any stand on this because I don't want to provide advice and be sued for it. Um, you have to think about opportunity costs. Um, if you invest in the house, there are returns to that. Uh, there are also costs. Um, so the idea that just getting on the property ladder, which is something people in the UK are obsessed by, unlike in other countries, is not in and of itself necessarily a good thing. Um, so you have to think about what's your expected returns in in other investments, um, what's going to happen to the S&P 500 index if you invest there? Um, don't know at the moment, but uh, that, that's something you have to weigh up and it also depends on your risk profile. Um, I think if I was speaking to someone in the pub about this, I, I would be prepared to go out and say I would do this, but I, I'm not going to do that for, because I am being recorded and I don't want to provide advice as, as someone who isn't a financial advisor. Okay, yeah, thanks, Dan. We're all being extra cautious yeah. there. Um, Jing? Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry to, to interrupt, Luis. Well, uh, just uh, uh, I think one thing to add on to the uh, overpayment. So I think if you, I, I mean, as, Dan, uh, as Danny and Adela said, that we are not the financial experts, so we cannot give any like a financial uh, 
advice or suggestions. But I mean, if you have ever made any overpayment uh, in your mortgage, then another thing you can do is probably you can discuss with your lenders to see if they can give you some like a payment uh, holiday. So this payment holiday will not affect your credit score, but it can help you maybe in a short term period to ease or release your financial burden in terms of the mortgage uh, and the monthly payment. So if you have made the overpayment, that is something you can you know discuss with your lenders. And apart from that, uh, I mean, uh, I think from the consumer or the individual perspective, it is very important to know your priorities and put together a budget. It's a, as Adela mentioned, that it's a complex issue. So there's no like single solution to all the problem, but at least you can know your priority and you can understand your budget. And then you can maybe go through your bank statements and trim any unnecessary expenses. So that is something you can definitely do without you know any financial expertise in this area. So this will help you to you know maybe uh, determine your expenditure priorities and ensure that you are watching what you spend. So it could be a useful way for you to you know think about your budget and your expenditure priorities. Yeah. I just say one one sentence really quickly. No matter which market you look at, whether it be stock markets, housing markets, or whatever, we don't have perfect information. So trying to time the market is always impossible. So if you think you're just going to hold, get cheap house, you don't know if that's going to happen. It's impossible to forecast the future. Absolutely. And and just one final point on this notion of doing things to help ourselves of course there are some things that we can do and there are ways in which some people or some households could, can cut back um, and there is a role for financial education and financial literacy here but let's remember that there are limits to that too as as one of our participants is reminding us here Kelly Harrison absolutely Kelly you know we um we are fully aware that there is there is a limit uh, a significant limit to the role of financial literacy and education and indeed to individual solutions to these problems which are systemic um, so uh, there are, of course, some households, some groups of people in, in society who can't cut back any further at all. It's not about sort of not, uh, uh, not, not buying sort of some of the finer things from the supermarket that week or, or not going out for dinner. Uh, there is simply no room to cut back. So um, for some people there are, and, and this is the point that I think we've tried to, we've tried to keep at the forefront throughout this discussion, which is this, this issue of inequality, really, that this whole cost of living crisis is absolutely affecting everybody, but it's also affecting different groups unequally. So let's move on now to what we can do about this. What are some of the policy solutions uh, to this problem? There are many, there are, there are potentially many, and um, we've already had some comments and questions in the chat to do with the role of universal basic income as a way of helping people to smooth income shocks and fluctuations in income that they're experiencing right now. Um, there are, of course, more measures for targeted support for low income and vulnerable households. Um, the energy price guarantee is one, but what else could be done? Um, is this about out of work support, in work support, greater job security? And then I'll, I'll come on to Adele and ask her about the role of the employer here. But let's start with some public policy solutions, first of all. Danny, what would your, what would your top policy solution be? OK, uh, I'll pick something that I don't think is going to be standard here, um, so, or at least in the context of the discussion. Um, first thing I'd say is you need to boost productivity and you need public policies that actually support R&D investments, um, now that might involve R&D tax credits or more of them uh, for, for firms to actually support those investments. Um, because without productivity growth, incomes don't rise. And ultimately, that's the problem we have here at the moment. Um, the UK has just had no growth for so long. Um, the other thing that's really negatively adversely affected the UK is that since austerity, demand has been fairly low. And when demand is low, the incentive to make productivity enhancing investments is low because you expect 
that cost of investment not to be recouped because it's not going to be enough people buying your goods or services. Uh, so I'd reverse Brexit, uh, which is the biggest negative demand shock the UK has faced recently as well. Um, I don't think that will happen. And arguably the, big, the biggest act of uh, self-harm, possibly, that uh, we've ever done to ourselves. Um, OK, thank you, Danny. Um, reverse Brexit, um, measures to improve productivity. Adele. Thank you. It's interesting because we do look at our employers as providing with a, as with an income and then we kind of stop there. I think everything else is up to us. But actually the relationship with our employers can be much more detailed than that. And certainly large employers can have a, a more general role in supporting our financial well-being. And it's not just about providing financial education, although I do think there's a role for that. We know that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't quite solve everybody's problems. Um, but one of the ways in which all employers, even the smaller ones, can help at the moment is to manage expectations, to provide people with information in plenty of time if something's going to change. Whether that's going to be that they have to cut the hours that they can offer for you to work, whether that's going to be that you're not going to get your intended uh, um, additional salary that you were hoping for, whatever it might be, I think communication is going to be vital because as individuals and households, we can't plan ahead if we don't know what changes are affect. And often firms are, are grappling with these issues themselves, but they have a sense of what's going on. So sharing that information, keeping people informed, I think is very, very important, giving them the maximum amount of time to make a difference. But I think as well, if we start to look at larger companies, at companies that have a little bit of weight in the market, they can also start to be negotiating prices on behalf of their employees. So they may not wish to give lump sums to their employees to, to use at the supermarket, but they may be able to negotiate discounts with certain providers. They may be able to provide certain items in bulk that people can buy and pick up in their workplace even. I've seen that happen in other places. So there are ways in which the workplace can use its natural advantage to help its employees. And I think that's something that we might see more and more as time goes by if they're prepared to to go that extra mile i think also workplaces may need to consider emergency loans it's a really difficult one and we know that payday loans are dangerous but sometimes the alternative is even more dangerous so if the workplace can do that in a way that is not particularly high cost lending in a way that can be paid back over a long period of time and with the financial well-being support in place to make sure that it doesn't create even more uh, dangerous financial situations, then I think it does have a role to play. Um, and I think the other way in which they can help in quite a practical way is actually to help each employee to manage their own costs. And I mentioned before about this kind of wastage that we're seeing in people in terms of people working from home and working in the office. So. I think a little bit more flexibility and understanding that for each person, the decision that they make in terms of commuting, in terms of childcare, in terms of heating will be different and a certain amount of flexibility to allow them to make the most cost effective decision about how and when they work. If their job allows it, and I fully appreciate that there are many, many people that work in, in a kind of employment where that is not possible, but where it is possible, making that decision can have a huge impact. And it might be as simple as allowing someone to work slightly longer hours for fewer days so that they don't have to commute so often. But just thinking about it and being as flexible as possible, I think will be another step in, <laughs> in finding a solution in the short term for the cost of living crisis until it's passed. Thank you, Adele, uh, unmute. Um, and Jane, did you, have any, did you have any final thoughts on this before I uh, wrap up with a couple more questions from the chat and from the Q&A? Uh, thank you, Louise. Uh, just uh, one quick point about the public policy. So uh, as we know that currently the UK government is increasing the interest rates and to be honest, maybe that's just my biased opinion. I think that may not be a bad idea 
but uh, it 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 will definitely have some impact, positive impact on the inflation, on control of the inflation. However, uh, as we just mentioned, we cannot witness this impact like straight away. It may take a while to you know have this full effect. And apart from that, uh, uh, as we discussed before, actually, so the current situation may affect the people quite differently depending on their income bracket. So this current situation may have a bigger impact on those with the lowest income and may have a less impact on those with the you know, highest income. So in that case, maybe from the government perspective, I'm not quite sure if they can you know, think about some policies or, or package to help different income brackets. It's not like a uniform package or uniform policy applied to all the people within the nation. Maybe you know some different package for different income brackets that would be more target and uh, more helpful. Yeah. Thank you, Jane. Danny, one final comment. If I was to do anything, I'd actually align the goals of monetary and fiscal policy at the moment, which are just so out of step. Which is one of the reasons we then see this doom loop that we're stuck in at the moment, uh, with the Bank of England unable to actually execute monetary policy without killing the financial sector and the, the, the pension sector as well. Thanks, Danny. Uh, there's, there's, one, there's a question just in the, in the Q&A that says, is it simplistic to ask whether immediately increasing benefits would lift the poorest out of poverty, i.e. dependence on food banks, no heating, um, etc.? Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's simplistic, no, uh, personally. Um, the Trussell Trust tells us that uh, over 2 million emergency food parcels were provided in 2021-2022. There is a still a huge, huge major over-reliance on food banks. Um, and at the heart of that is a lack of income. So measures to increase people's income, whether that's through an uplift in universal credit or other such benefits, or indeed a more radical intervention such as universal basic income would of course go a long way to helping many, many households. Um, I think we're gonna have to stop there with the, with the, uh, the questions and uh, to keep to time, I do need to wrap up. There is one final, final comment really in the, in the, uh, the Q and A, which I can't ignore, which is what work is CASM doing in the next or in the short, medium and longer term to influence policy changes? I think that's the question. Um, well, we're doing lots of different things. Uh, Danny and his colleague, Christoph Gertz, are doing a lot of work looking at evaluating different sort of furlough schemes um, in the event of another pandemic. Um, how can furlough schemes um, be developed sort of um, for firms and for households, both nationally and internationally, um, in a more cost-effective way? Uh, I think that's, that's correct, right, Danny? Um, so lots of interesting work there and, and other work on easing house, uh, household financial strain. We're doing work looking at the gender wealth gap. There is in the UK and there continues to be a significant gender pay gap, gender pension gap, um, gender wealth or indeed investment gap. And we have somebody starting with us soon who is very interested in um, gender and wealth inequality. And we'll be doing a lot more there, looking at also sort of long-term savings and how all the different disadvantages women in particular face throughout their lifetimes uh, accumulate, crystallize in later life to result in much poorer financial outcomes in retirement. What can be done there? Um, Adele is doing lots of work on financial inclusion, of course, and also on financial literacy more broadly and Adele's work sees her evaluating really interesting financial literacy and education policies internationally, including in the Pacific Islands and Africa and, and, and much more besides. So do check out our website and have a look at some of the work that we're doing. And by all means, if you're interested, uh, our monthly seminar series is open to all if you wish to sign up to the um, mailing list. All that's left for me to do now is uh, is, is wrap up, is thank our panel, of course. Thank you to Professor Danny McGowan, to Professor Adele Atkinson, to Dr. Jing Du. Thank you very much for your time and for your fascinating and invaluable insights to this, to this timely and important topic today. Um, just a few notes to, to our audience. Thank you, of course, for attending today. Uh, the follow-up email to this event will have links to charities and other organizations that you can go to for 
advice and financial support. We're very aware this is a very, uh, a very sensitive topic. And as we continue with this series online, we're keen to hear from you about areas of research you're interested in. Please share your suggestions with uh, our colleagues in the alumni events team. And we finally, we welcome your feedback on this event. So there'll be a link to a short feedback survey in just a moment. But for now, thank you once again to everybody for attending. We hope you enjoyed it and we hope to see you at the next one. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Louise. Thanks, Louise. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Louise. Bye. Bye bye. Yeah. <clears throat>